My name is Perry Clausen. I'm executive director of the San Joaquin Water Quality Coalition. Uh, appreciate you all coming this morning for the third of three meetings that we've had this week on the uh, program that is a result of a nitrogen management plan reporting. And this is the first time we've ever done this. 17 years we've been doing the coalition work and these meetings and this outlier outreach is the first time we've done it and we're a little rough around the edges, so I'll let you know that off at the beginning. And also that we, this is a work in progress. And because you've been ident you have parcels identified as outliers, be calm about it. It's not, you know, it's not gonna result in enforcement. We're still trying to figure out what's the best way to work on understanding what the right amount of fertilizer, the right amount of nitrogen fertilizer to put on our crops, including you know, almonds as well. And I'll explain in a little bit why almonds is, uh, we're focusing on almonds on these first meetings. So today we're gonna talk about how we identify outliers, what the statistical methods are, uh, what is, uh, if you're an outlier, if you have an outlier parcel, what do we do now? Uh, what if your data is wrong? What, what to do to correct that? And then to give you an idea of where all this fits together, because this is just a small piece of the huge puzzle that we have in front of us to try to figure out how to, how to uh, show the public and the water board that we're not over fertilizing, causing groundwater contamination from any of our activities. So why do we have to outline, uh, identify outliers? Well, it's in the, in, in the waste discharge requirements that are uh, implemented for all the water coalitions in the Central Valley. This is not an East San Joaquin requirement. Every grower, every coalition in the Central Valley has an outlier process that they're gonna be going through. Lucky us, we were the first to have our order adopted in 2012 and the, West, uh, the general order that we're regulated under. So we're a year ahead of everybody else, and so we're the first one to kind of pull the ditch, if you will, to try to figure out what's the best way to, to move forward on these. We have to identify outlier parcels every year when we evaluate the reports that you turn in. Uh, the next one, of course, for 19 uh, use, fertilizer use is due uh, next week. And what we do with, out of the data that's submitted we, is we look at the ranges for the multi-year A over R ratio, and uh, we'll go over that in a minute, but it's for the last three years, not counting 19, so it's 18, 17, and 16 data that we looked at to, to do the analysis. And um, the AR, the applied over the removed is what we use. So the applied uh, nitrogen divided by the, uh, the removed gives us a ratio that we then compare you to your other fields and to other growers of almonds. And then we've also, we're also doing the applied minus the removed to give you a better idea of where, what, what the uh, excess might be when we look at the ratios. Because as a grower, the A over R kind of doesn't really mean much. If you're a 1.4 or a 2.4, what does that mean from my application standpoint? But it, what it is, is it's an index that allows us to compare you to other growers. But really the, the, the bottom line, if you will, that we're gonna eventually be de dealing with is the applied nitrogen minus the removed, which will show potential excess nitrogen. So if it's showing 200 pounds over your removed, you know that you may be putting on too much nitrogen or if it's, if it's pretty close to what it should be, then you know you're, you're, you're very close. But we're not using those numbers for our outlier parcel designation at this point. That's really, for, at this point, is for your own information and in comparison to what, this, what the target number is. Um, it's in, that, in that waste discharge requirements, there's not a specific definition of how to do this. So we have proposed back to the regional board how we might designate outliers. Um, so so we've, we've come up with an approach that we'll explain in a bit. It uses a statistical method called interquartile range, which is, I'll go into that a little bit more later on, on why we chose that method. And if we do this for a couple years, we're gonna go back and we find it's not working. We'll go back to the regional board and say, we gotta do this a, a different approach. And this is actually the second approach we've used. And again, I'll explain it later why the first approach just wasn't fair and didn't, didn't come up the, uh, to what we were trying to accomplish. So simply put, I did not take statistics. I'll admit that. And when you talk interquartile range, you might as well be talking to me in Greek because I don't understand what it means. But I do understand bell curves. 
and it, it has a similar sort of uh, illustration of, of what that I, the uh, interquartile range is. So this is a curve showing all the fertilizer application, nitrogen application of almond growers. So the majority of growers you can see are in this, uh, where this hump is at. And here's 1.0, again, applied uh, nitrogen divided by removed nitrogen. So what, what this IQR did is set a threshold that says, okay, right here at about 1.8 is where the outliers begin. So you had a parcel, you all are here because you had parcels that were identified in this range on this side. So to, to give a really crude example of what the A over R is, is if, you, if we do the math of applied divided by the removed, so we have a number that the almond board developed, it was 68 pounds of nitrogen for 1,000 pounds of nut meats. If you add an efficiency range onto that, a perfect applied minus removed is about a 1.4. Oops. About 1.4, which puts it right about in this area here. So most of the growers are very close to what the almond board and university research is saying. But what if you go up to a two or a three, say the extreme example, and there's some out there that put on three times more than theoretically you should have put on for that when you do the applied divided by the removed. So this is really the fundamental way that we're coming up with these, these uh, outlier designations for a parcel. And so what, what is very important, we talk about this in our annual member meetings, is crop coefficient. This is the number that we're forever going to be graded on. And fortunately for almonds, the Almond Board of California did, has been doing with some pretty extensive work over the last 10 years to figure out what exactly is the amount of nitrogen that is taken off in the nuts and stored in the tree. So that ends up being what the crop coefficient is. And for walnuts, they have a pretty good number. Pistachio is good. Uh, but with grapes, it starts falling off, and a lot of other crops don't have a good crop coefficient. I grow nectarines in Fresno County, and the number they have is based out of some information out of Italy, I believe. And it's not, it's scary the number is off so bad. And unfortunately, we don't have an organization like the Almond Board to do the studies. I'm not sure what we're going to do over time, we nectarine growers, to make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to do on, on the nitrogen application uh, rates that we use. But anyway, uh, the crop coefficient is something that we're going to be working on as a coalition, all the coalitions in the Central Valley, working both with the other coalitions, but the commodity groups who have responsibility for research and marketing of these various uh, crops that we're growing. And if you get, when you get your annual report, you can read more about you know, the ones, the crops that we have good numbers and not so good numbers in. So again, this A over R is the metric for grower performance, we call it, that we use to compare your parcels to other parcels. And then um, we get these A over R values for all the almond growers across our coalition region, so you're not compared to Kern County growers or Butte County growers, it's just our three counties. And then we do this uh, interquartile range calculation to figure out which, which parcels um, fall in that range. So one thing, uh, we already had a talk with a gentleman this morning. If your data that you submitted to us was incorrect, let us know. We have a change form over there when you checked in. And if you, if you look at your data, you think, and I had a guy yesterday say, we were just estimating at that time. We didn't, we didn't know what these reports were, so we just did a roundabout numbers. And they were off by magnitudes. And it put them into outlier territory because it was inaccurate information. So if you're in, you fall in that category, make sure you get that form. Make sure we change that. The other thing that we're really emphasizing that some of you in the room have had is if you have an anomaly, you lose half your trees, or you had a, you know, some kind of disease problem and it just knocked your yield out, you'd already fertilized, and your yield ended up being a third of what it should have been, let us know, and that's going to be important information. Because we, when we do a designation for a parcel of an outlier and submit a report, and then we say, well, there was, there was five, there was, I think we had um, 90 outlier parcels in the coalition. So if 40 of them and, and uh, say, hey, we had wrong information, we're going to have to justify that to the regional water board. We want to make sure that it's legitimate. We're sure they are, but we need that information. 
Uh, so that data change form will give you the ability to write down what it was that was odd. And then what we'll do is recalculate that, that information based on that and, and, and reevaluate whether that parcel still needs to be an outlier. Some may and some may not, but it's going to be a case by case basis with each parcel. So why do we have to identify outliers? So this, uh, this whole approach really is a, a, a um, I guess you would call it an evolution from what we did in surface water. When we started in 2004 sampling all of our waterways, we had roughly 15 waterways in 2004, and by 2010 we had 25 waterways. And we had pesticides showing up in almost every one of our waterways. So what we proposed to the Water Board and was accepted is that we would do a management plan approach, watershed management plan approach, identify all the parcels along the waterway, have meetings with the growers that were on those waterways, one-on-one -on -one meetings, not, not meetings like this, have a survey that would, we, they would fill out what practices did they use, and then we'd let them know, for instance, we would find Lorsman in the water, we'd look at their pesticide use reports and, and, and go to the growers and say, you know, we did, we're not saying that you did it, but Lorsban is a problem, here's things that you can do in these watersheds. We went through that process from 2008, we're still doing it, and we've cleaned up almost all of our waterways. It, it, it is a result of partly this watershed management plan and partly because growers change practices to, uh, to eliminate these problems. So come back to groundwater. So here we are, we've done our uh, assessment of our groundwater quality throughout our region, and we have basins that have extremely high nitrates. And it's not just irrigated agriculture, we have dairy, we have cities, food processors, we have various sources of nitrates that could have caused that problem. But there is, and there's overwhelming evidence, if you will, from the universities and others that have showed some of those nitrates are coming from irrigated agriculture. So what we had to do was put together a comprehensive groundwater quality management plan to the water board that outlines what are we going to do to try to minimize excess nitrate going into groundwater. Hence, we came up with this plan approach, which is all about uh, addressing the exceedance of, of nitrates in groundwater. And what we said is we're going to do outreach and education to, the, to our members that have parcels with, that are identified as outliers. So what this does, what the plan will do is it gives us a, a, a map, if you will, of how we're going to go forward in the next 10 to 20 to 30 years to address ex excess nitrate that may be moving past the root zone. If we didn't do this, there's an option in the, in the uh, program that we didn't want to have that said that if we don't do this comprehensive plan, that every single grower has to do one of these groundwater management plants, which we said that's not practical. It's not going to solve the problem, and it's way too much paperwork, even beyond what we're having to do now. So we, we submitted this plan. It was approved, and it, and it outlines what we do with, with what, what are first outliers and then continue the outreach and education to try to minimize the excess nitrogen that goes on a crop. Now, I want to stop and pause here and say that what we are not trying to do is l limit the amount of nitrogen fertilizer you put on. Uh, we have argued with the water board, that's not the issue. That's not why we have groundwater contamination. It's the excess nitrogen. So if you have a 5,000 pound or, uh, almond uh, per acre yield, you're going to need a lot of nitrogen. You're going to need a lot of nitrogen to grow 5,000 pounds of almonds. So why would there be a limit on what, what you need to put on? To grow 5,000 pounds, it's going to be a lot more than somebody, if they're growing it right, or getting 1,000 pounds. The main thing is, what is the excess? If they put the right amount for 5,000 pounds, everybody should be good. Water board, don't make us reduce our, our nitrogen applications to a predetermined amount, because that's, that does not solve the problem. It's the excess that we're focusing on. So, we, uh, so we're taking that approach, saying, Water Board, don't get involved, don't try to mandate uh, what the amount that can be put on, but let us work on the excess. Now, to say, to, just to give you an idea what Water Boards can do in the Central Coast, those vegetable growers are facing now 
a uh, program that's being reviewed this year that's going to set an, a maximum amount of nitrogen per acre regardless of the crop, the vegetable crop. So they've already started down that road. The water boards have the authority, they think, to do that. But we're avoiding that by taking this approach. All right, so what, when we started, the, we'll put the plan together. You know, we have 700,000 acres of membership, over 3,000 members, and we said, Water Board, we cannot do all the crops all at once and take this on. So we had to prioritize, and the prioritization is done by acreage. So your crop wins. Almonds are the biggest acreage crop in the, in the, coalition, uh, pro in the coalition right now. So we're starting with almonds this year. And then uh, next year we'll do wine grapes, pistachios, and walnuts. Identify again outliers, let them know about this uh, parcels, uh, outlier parcels, and let them know, uh, go through the same process with them. Then sweet potatoes, corn silage, processing tomatoes, figs, alfalfa, and peaches and plums. So when we get about here, we're, when we have these four crops, we have about 80% of our acreage covered. So these crops listed here are, are about 20% of our total 700,000 acres. So there's five steps that we'll be going through with uh, growers who have these outlier parcels. First, we have to identify the sources, starting with the outlier parcels. That's the parcels that show potential excess nitrogen. Provide this education uh, regarding management practices. And Sebastian Saw with the Almond Board is here today. He's gonna uh, give you a really good rundown of, uh, of some recommendations on nitrogen management. And then we have the survey that you're filling out for us on uh, practices that we were able to take from the Almond Board University, talking to CCAs on really what, what are the good practices to use for managing nitrates or nitrogen fertilizer. And so we're going to encourage you to you know, look at those closely. Many of those you're probably doing already, but really encourage growers to adopt these practices and then we're gonna come back and evaluate the multi-year AR ratios and then provide feedback to you over uh, the years as to how you're doing in comparison to the other outlier parcels. So this probably be better, I don't know if you can read this, this is in your handouts that you got if you need to look at it closely, but the timeline is such that you know, we, we identified the outlier parcels last year, we developed this list of these practices and then these packets were mailed out to you in January. These are the meetings, this is today's meetings, these member crop specific workshops, the, uh, and then submitting the survey after the meeting today. And then what we'll do for is reevaluate uh, re your AR ratios in the coming years, in the next five years. And then five years, we're gonna recheck in with all, everybody, everybody that has a parcel and say, all right, you're good. You're out of the outlier mode. You're not, you, you have to do nothing further, but we're, we're in the order itself is not specific on what whether we have to turn the, the growers names over to the water board or if we can ask for another couple of years to work with the growers but we have really five years to to try to remedy and get your a over r in a in a range that's, that's similar to the other uh, almond growers so then how are they the parcels are outlined our outlier parcels identified so i mentioned this earlier so we take your 16 17 and 18 data and we aggregate it we add up all the nitrogen applied in three years per acre all the nuts harvested three acres and then do the math and then each uh parcel is specific to a member and, and it requires that you have a mature almond crop for three years in a row so we've had, we found some growers who put their uh, new plantings in this and didn't let us know. So that's, that does not uh, push you into an outlier status. So that's one of the things on your data. If you had a third, fourth year, fifth year, we're considering close to no, uh, a normal production. So if you mistakenly put a two, three, four year old orchard in there, let us know and then we're gonna back it off and recalculate your, uh, your, uh, the, the uh, A over R totals for those parcels. And then again, we use that interquartile range. And for you, the, for those of you that really like math, I'm not even gonna try to explain this. I just say that they're using this approach. It's, it's a better approach than we used before. And because what we used before the first couple of years was we said 10%, we took the bell curve and said, all right, 10% of the growers that, that are on the upper end are outliers. And where that doesn't work is say, we use that approach 
well and the growers get better, that 10% then keeps moving closer to the center. So you never get rid of outliers. You always have 10% above the mean, the average that, that is uh, applied in the area. So that doesn't, that's not appropriate. So we, we switch to this IQR approach, which eliminates that, that, um, that potential for just always having people be outliers, always have a group of outliers. And if you want to see the specific math calculation, it's on your handout. You can review that and take it to your college son that took math. I showed it to my son who took math, and he put his hands over his ears and said, I don't want to look at it. I, don't like that. I didn't like that part, that part of my math class. All right, another thing that we're really trying to emphasize, and we are in our member meetings, is this concept of pump and fertilize. So when, when you do your reports and you have high nitrates in your water, we want to encourage you to integrate that number into your fertilizer, your nitrogen application that you put on each year. One thing that we, we, we know about the pump and fertilize is that there, there's really only two ways to clean up our aquifers that have high nitrates. One is um, we put more water in it, you dilute the nitrates that's in the groundwater, your dilution is a solution in this case, which, is, which hopefully Sigma is gonna help us out on. That's one approach. The only other approach there is, is pump that water out with a nitrate, put it on a crop and have the crop uptake that nitrate. Treatment is off the, you know, there's no way treatment would be feasible to pump that water out and treat it, treat it through reverse osmosis or some other method that cost a fortune, it wouldn't be practical. But the, so the water board, the activists really love this approach because it is, it is something that can, that is uh, usable to clean up, or it's practical to clean up our waterways. However, there's a big however on this, and I've, we've, if you've been to our member meetings, we've repeated it, but it's worth repeating in case you weren't uh, listening at that moment. All right, so here's the example. You got 35 parts per million of, of nitrate in your groundwater, just an example. If you put on 30 acre inches of water, that should that equals three, 236 pounds of nitrogen per acre that's coming on in your irrigation water and there's been enough studies now to show that that is usable by the plant however the big qualifier of that is that 30 acre inches that assumes that all 30 acre inches of that water is used and taken up by the tree and that's not possible uh, depending it depends on your irrigation efficiency uh, the, a good example also that it's not practical is right now it's so dry. We haven't had rain since December. There's a lot of us that are out there irrigating our trees just to get that soil profile oh. filled up. That tree is not taking up nitrogen right now. But if you put on six inches, you shouldn't take the assumption that I just put on, and I'm doing the rough math, that I put on 25 pounds of nitrogen because your tree did not take up that nitrogen. So the number that we're using, and this is something to talk to agronomist about that knows your orchard well, is maybe you half this. Maybe you do 115 pounds in your budget and say, I'm likely going to be able to get 115 pounds per acre of, of nitrogen from my irrigation water if it's 35 parts per million. And if your crop needs 180, then it, it's, it's legitimate to supplement that with another 70 pounds of nitrogen or, or whatever the number is. So again, try to, try to take advantage of it, but don't depend on it totally to be your nitrogen source because of the efficiency, efficiency uh, problem of that. And I had a grower up that had even higher, he had, I think, about 70 parts per million of, of nitrate in his groundwater. He said, all right, I'm going to try it. I'm going to not fertilize my crop. He had yellow leaves before harvest. And his, his tissue testing showed that he was deficient in nitrogen. And it was because, and, and thinking about it and looking at it, it was because of this factor, is that trees did not take up all of that nitrogen because water that's around the tree and not in the roots wasn't taken up and used by that, that uh, tree to uh, grow the crop. So anyway, it is something worth considering and using, and we're trying to figure out a way in our reports to gather this information about how many growers are using this technique. I get asked that all the time by the water board. How many growers are really doing that? We don't have a method to, to collect that right now, because it is a good story for us to tell to the water board and the public. All right, so member responsibilities. 
for uh, outlier parcels, you need to continue submitting that uh, summary report, nitrogen management summary report, again, due next week, and then uh, attending this workshop as you are now. And if you know anybody else that's, uh, that's outlier parcel, we are taping this and we'll post it online for growers to watch. And then completing that survey, the MPIR survey, we will do a follow-up. If you check things on there, say, yeah, I'm going to try that in a couple of years, we'll come back to you and say, were you able to uh, implement the practice that uh, you, you indicated on the survey? And then we want to demonstrate through a, a water, a groundwater sampling that eventually nitrates are, are going to improve in our water, in our aquifers. So our responsibility is we're going to take all these surveys that you fill out, taking your name off of it, that way it'll be an almond survey uh, in Madera County, or in, and I don't even think we'll do the counties, but we will aggregate that, send a summary report to the regional board, and then we're going to be tracking your changes in management practices over the next five years. And again, that five year 2025, we'll be come, coming, getting in touch with you about that. And then what we'll do in 2025, is we'll look at your applications for 22, 23, and 24. So this year we're looking at 16, 17, and 18. So what we do continually is move that curve up. So your, your 16 goes away next year, your 17 goes away next year. So it's, it's a three-year bracket that we continually analyze with the newer uh, practices that you use and, and the applications that you use on those fields. So the other thing uh, that's important about this is that, as I mentioned earlier, this is only one thing of several uh, re requirements that all the coalitions have uh, that we're working on. Uh, we've got a few years to accomplish these, but they are going to be uh, equally challenging. One is th that there is the thought in the, at the state water board that, that there's acceptable ranges of fertilizer applications for each crop. And they're asking the coalitions to submit to them with the help of the university and with the commodity groups, what's an acceptable range of nitrogen to put on for a, a, a certain amount of yield. So if you get 2,000 pounds of, nitri uh, of nut meats, what is the acceptable range? And we've got a long ways to go to define some of these terms, acceptable to who? My argument, acceptable for good production and a quality crop. But we, they want us to publish acceptable ranges for nitrogen application for almonds at a certain yield level. So we're still working on that. I don't know what the right number is. We've got the basis of it, what Sebastian talks about. But we have to do this for every crop grown in the coalition, well, in the Central Valley. Then, as I mentioned early, earlier, these crop uh, nitrogen coefficients, uh, we have some that are not so good, as I mentioned earlier, so that we, we need to improve these. I mean, this is our, this is our um, curve that we're being graded on. These crop coefficients are the number that, that, are, that we are being compared to to, to determine this, this uh, excess nitrogen. So we have to have good coefficients uh, for our crops by March 2021. I think we're, as I mentioned, we're good shape with almonds, pistachios, and walnuts, and then by uh, for 95% of our acreage, and then 99% of the acreage by March 2023. Then the other thing that we're working on is uh, what's called the Management Practice Evaluation Program, and this is a program that where we're identifying practices that growers can use that, that are going to help with an efficient nitrogen applications. What you're going to hear today from Sebastian is the four R's, the right time, right place, right amount, uh, right product, and we're really going to hang our hat on those. Those are developed by the commodity group specific for those crops, so we're, we're evaluating those in, in field studies. University is looking at them to see if, in fact, when you use the four R's, are you protective of groundwater? That's, that's the overriding theme. They want growers of irrigated croplands to not cause or contribute to groundwater contamination with nitrates. So when we find effective practices, that's what they will do. The last, last issue, I know some of you were in the annual meeting, I got my jars and stood up in the front and did this illustration. So this groundwater protection formulas, values, and targets. The initial draft of the new order said that they wanted each grower on each field to do analysis of how much nitrates going 
past the root zone into the aquifer below, below their field. We said there's no way that that's practical. The cost would be enormous. So let us as coalitions develop this groundwater protection formula value and target for a township range, 36 square miles. So where will take all the data of A minus R, the applied minus remove equals the excess. And here's an illustration we use. So we take the A minus R of all the fields in that, in that 36 square mile area, and then we, we subtract the amount of water that's, uh, that may be going in the groundwater from rainfall and nearby waterways and other things, microbial degradation, um, uh, the gassing off of nitrogen. And we, we put that in a calculation or in a formula, and that gives us our value. So the value is then compared to the target that, is, uh, that we have to reach in the groundwater. Right now for nitrates, it's 10 milligrams per liter that we have to meet, meet in the groundwater. So what we're gonna do over the next 35 years, we're given 35 years to reach the target, is come up with interim targets that we can hopefully meet in this groundwater aquifer. This is very complicated. We have not come up with a formula yet of how we're going to do that, but we have to turn one into the regional board here this summer, and it's going to be challenged, I'm sure, but this is going to be our overall agriculture grading system, if you will. It's going to take individual information and then determine over a large area whether we are causing or contributing to nitrate contamination in groundwater. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks, uh, Perry, for the invitation. and. Uh, thanks uh, for coming up here. Um, again, my name is Sebastian Sa. Uh, a little bit of a background of myself before I start, so you have an idea who is in front. Um, I'm Chilean, so I have a little bit of an accent there, as you may have realized already, uh, which means that I'm happy to stop by if there is something you didn't understand or you would like further clarification. Um, in Chile, uh, where I grew, I'm the third generation of table grape growers. Uh, so I've always been connected to the ag business and the industry. I just love it. And with that background, I went to UC Davis to get a PhD in plant nutrition and, and tree uh, production in almonds. I got there a PhD with Dr. Patrick Brown, uh, where we developed the natrium budget calculator and the best management practice for natrium. So that, I think that, that's why I'm talking here. Then I moved back to Chile uh, for four years. I was a professor there uh, in fruit tree production in deciduous trees. And then I decided to switch gears. And as this is my third year as a senior manager at the Almond Board. Uh, and there I get to manage the research portfolio in where I oversee the different projects that we are doing. Uh, and I always like to play this bridge between the growers and the researchers and bring your needs to our researchers or to the talents uh, people that we have in the universities and ask them to help to solve them. So uh, for me, it's also really informative to be here and listen to what your, your comments are. With that said, I would like to start my presentation with this slide. Uh, by way of background, uh, this slide illustrates all the essential nutrients that are needed to grow the plant, any plant, and to grow almonds. And the interesting thing of this uh, slide is that it, it's grouping the different nutrients that are needed to grow plants by the amount of management that you need to invest in the different nutrients. In red, those are the nutrients that in almond production you always have to manage. Every season, every year, you need to think about those nutrients. In yellow, the ones that it will be, you will have to monitor and manage uh, accordingly, and the ones in green, isolated occurrence. So why do I bring this up? Because as you will listen through my presentation, uh, that I will mainly focus in nitrogen, I do think that the principles and concepts that I'm going to discuss today do hold for all these elements. So keep that in mind that whenever we talk about the four R's or whenever we talk about the nitrogen budget approach, it's also important for potassium and other elements to keep in mind. Going into the specifics of nitrogen, whenever we think about nitrogen, we need to think about the four R's concept. 
Do you guys know about the four R's? Have you heard them before? I will say that yes, I see a couple of faces there and a couple of fingers up there too. So the first one is for right rate. The right rate means the how much to apply. How do I know how much to apply? The first thing I need to keep in mind, to know how much to apply, I need to have all the inputs and, uh, and outputs of natrium. So what is the tree demand? How much is the tree asking me to put on? That's the how much, the right rate. Once I know how much, I also need to know when to apply it. So that goes into the right time. I need to apply when the tree need it. So once I know how much I need to apply, it makes sense to apply when the tree need it. In other words, I have to be careful uh, and not apply it when the tree is not going to be able to uptake it. So for instance, in winter, we know that the tree is not working. So applications around winter are very risky. They will leach because the tree is not actively uptaking natrium. So that goes into the right time. So the first one is the how much, and the second one is the when, when to apply it. The third one, where, where to apply it. So once I know how much I have to apply, once I know when I have to apply, I have to know where I have to apply it. I have to apply where those active roots are. And we're going to talk a little bit on, on that, uh, about that later on. But I have to make sure that whenever I do a fertigation event, I'm trying to allocate that fertilizer where the active roots are. And I'm going to give you some tips how to do it. So that's the third one. The fourth one, I call it two in one, because it talks about the right source and monitoring. So I, there are different options of fertilizers. There are organic options, inorganic options. In organic options, you have a bunch of different fertilizers. In organic options, you have a bunch of different options, like cover crops and compost or things like that. And what you need to know is your source so you can better understand what are the benefits of that source versus others or the particular challenge. Uh, each source has opportunities and challenge. And also monitoring. Uh, we're going to touch bases on that one. Once you're following this R, you need to have a way to know if you're doing things correct, like a check, like a speed check. Um, and, we're gonna, and we have worked a lot on developing a new tool for almonds, uh, which we call the early leaf nutrient sampling. So you can sample now in April. And, help to, and that will help you to know if you are doing things so correctly. So. <coughs> Those are, that's the concept for ours, and also for natrium, and, uh, and also while keeping, sorry, keeping in mind these four R's, at the Almond Board, in our California Almond Sustainability Program, we have invested a lot of time um, to simplify this uh, and, to, uh, and to put together the results of our research projects in what we call the Natrium Budget Calculator. And this is a step-by-step -step calculator that will help you to, uh, to define how much and when to apply it and generate the reports uh, that you will need for in this area. So it's a user-friendly calculator. I invite you to use it uh, to, to check where you're doing. And it's going to help you to follow best management practices. Um, with that said, what I would like to do next is to illustrate the logic that it's behind that calculator. Okay? Because I do think that by f understanding the logic, we can really take very smart and better decisions on how to manage nitrogen. You won't, have probably, you won't need to do the math that I will walk through, but understand the logic, uh, it will be great. And then you have these tools that will do the math for you and make the things easier. So the first thing to keep in mind for nitrogen management is that nitrogen is an act of balance, OK? Natrium management is an act of balance. The natrium cycle is an act of balance. In one part of the, cycle of the, of the equation, you have the supply rate. And in the other side of the equation, you have the demand rate. And those are the two functions that you always need to think about. What are my natrium inputs? That will give you the supply part of the equation. And what are my nutrients outputs? 
That will give you the demand part of the equation. When we think about the supply part, we're talking about this area here that I'm highlighting. And you can see that the supply, all that is meaning all the nitrogen that's getting into my system, into my orchard, has three components. The cover crops, manure, compost, organic matter, the irrigation, in the, the, the nitrogen in the water, and the commercial nitrogen fertilizer. And one thing that I have observed through time is that we tend to focus so much in that one, while in fact, we also need to keep in mind those other ones. And these ones, specifically that one, are free source of nitrogen. So we should actually take the opportunity to use that nitrogen and account for it so the amount of fertilizer that we put actually uh, it's the supplement to provide the right rate. So that's about the supply function. Then when you start looking at the other sides of the equation at the demand function, you can see that the demand in almond trees is mainly a function of harvest nuts. And yes, you need, a, you need for, uh, to, to make that tree grow and for vegetative growth, but and, and we have studied all that, and we now have a very good idea of how much the tree needs to have adequate and sufficient and highly productive amount, amount of nitrogen. Uh, 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 sorry, and good amount of nitrogen to be highly productive. So those are the two, th act, that's the act of balance, the supply versus the demand. And it's an open cycle. <coughs> nitrogen is an open cycle because there's all, there is, there is volatilization going on, as well as leaching go, potential leaching going on, as well as fixation in the soil going on. And our job as managers and, and as good nitrogen management planners is, in my view, to reduce these arrows here as much as possible, reduce the volatilization and the leaching as much as possible, and match, meaning that I match the supply with the demand as best as possible. So let's talk how to calculate the right rate, okay? I'm gonna show you four bullets, four steps of how the logic that I use behind to calculate the right rate. So the first thing is that you need to know the tree nitrogen demand based on predicted yield. In almonds, we have seen over and over that the amount of kernels that you're gonna produce tells you so much about how much nitrogen that tree is gonna need that really having an early estimation of how much the tree is gonna produce, it's a really good indicator of how much the tree, tree is gonna need in terms of nitrogen, nat in terms of nitrogen. So, and I get it, it's, it's hard to know today, for instance, how much the tree is gonna produce this season. But an informed guess is better than a blind guess. If you are in an immature orchard that is still growing, and it's mainly in the third year, fourth year, I don't think you should be, there, I mean, it's impossible that's probably gonna get 5,000 pounds this season. So maybe we wanna use a very informed guess, the historical yield, the average of all previous years, and so on. And then we can adjust that through the season. But again, an informed guess early in the season, like today, is way better than doing it blind. There's a question there. Okay, you have a young worker, second, third leaf orchard. Mm -hmm. How much, how would you calculate how much nitrogen you need for the tree to grow? Because you're all, uh, let's put it this way, in order if you want two feet to grow, you're gonna have to have so much nitrogen for the leaves. Yes, so in a, in a young orchard, you are much more focused in vegetative growth than in productive growth, correct? Um, so, and we have the numbers for vegetative growth and the guidance for young orchard, okay? And once you are in a more mature orchard, you, the numbers I'm gonna show you are come for both, for vegetative growth as well as produ productive growth. And when you use the calculators, also when you have very low yield in a mature orchard, it's gonna compensate for vegetative growth. So long story short, in our studies, the amount of vegetative, if you account all the vegetative growth, and you weigh it and you calculate how much nitrogen is there, it's not that much. It's very little compared to the amount that is in the kernels. In the, um, 
you're talking in the neighborhood of maybe 30 pounds in vegetative growth uh, that is in the tree uh, versus 68 pounds per 1,000 pounds of kernel that is in the fruit, okay? So uh, when it's growing, there are guidance, uh, and, and yes, you have to focus in the vegetative growth and whatever you're gonna get for fruit production, but it's way less than fruit growth. And if it's not growing, and if it's not growing, it's not because of nitrogen, it's because of other factors, okay? So second, you need to calculate all the nitrogen credits. So once you calculate the demand, the how much, you need to calculate all the nitrogen credits that will come from the water, from organic manure, ex uh, for compost, etc. from compost. And third, you calculate the amount of fertilizer needed. So it's uh, the third part of the logic when you calculate the amount of fertilizer. Once you calculate the amount of fertilizer, then you need to apply it. And when you're gonna apply it, you need to include the efficiency factor, okay? And we're gonna talk about the efficiency factor and the numbers that we use. This is the same thing. This is the same bullets rearranged in a different way. Where you can see in this part of the equation the demand function, which will be how much the tree needs, minus the supply function, which as I pointed out, is the sum of how much nitrogen is in the soil, in the water, and through fertilization. So again, fertilization is just one component of the supply function that has to keep in mind the other components and also responds to what the tree is asking for. To define how much the tree is asking for, and here's a little bit of the, pic of the pictures that help us to identify how much is needed to produce fruit, uh, to produce uh, kernels. We did sequential harvest of the trees for several years. We collected samples across the year and we in measure individual tree yield, and we uh, work for a lot of time with a big crowd to come up with these simplified tables, okay? There are, other, there are more data, of course, that came out from the project, but I think this table really produced a very good set of information to how much the tree needs. And here's where we incorporate that for per every 1,000 pounds of kernel produced, there are about 68 pounds of nitrogen that are removed from the orchard, okay? And you have the other numbers there for potassium and phosphorus. So that's a great piece of information. We now know, thanks to the results, robust results, how much nitrogen is removed by the crop and, and how much the nitrogen the tree needs. So let's use a conceptual example to understand how much nitrogen needs and all this information I have given you so far so we can reiterate what I'm talking about. So let's keep in mind this 68 pounds, per 1, 000, 68 pounds of nitrogen per 1,000 pounds of kernels. Keep that in mind and this equation in mind. So let's now think that we are in an orchard that the production is gonna be 2,500 pounds of kernel per acre. 2,500 pounds per acre, or no more than that. So I go ahead and multiply 2.5 times 68 and gives me 170 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Why did I do that? Because 2.5 times 68 is equal to, it's using the ratio of 68 pounds of nitrogen, of nitrogen per 1,000 pounds of kernel, okay? So that gives me 170 pounds of nitrogen per acre to support that yield. Then let's now assume that we have other sources of nitrogen, other inputs like compost and cover crops and in the water, and let's say that all of the, them add up to 22 pounds of nitrogen credit. Are you guys following up to there? You got it? Okay, so we have, we have a demand of 170 and we have a natural supply of 22. So 170, minus 22 gives you 148 pounds of nitrogen that are needed, okay? So the 148 pounds of nitrogen that are needed is not necessarily exactly what I need to apply, okay? So that's what the tree needs. We calculate how much the tree needs, but now I need to incorporate the efficiency. So that's the how much. How much do, does your orchard need in these conditions to produce the 2,500 pounds? Um, 
148. Okay? So now I'm going to deliver those. I'm going to make sure that those trees get the 148. So I incorporate the nitrogen efficiency. In our studies, and we have observed higher efficiencies of uh, up to 80% or so uh, when we're following the four R's. And we come up with a conclusion that if you are following the four R's, the, the efficiency is, up, is 70%. So meaning that if, you need, if your trees need 148 pounds per acre, you divide that by 0 0.7 and gives you 211 pounds per acre. Okay. So that is the application that it's being recommended. Do you guys follow that? Any question? That's, so when is the tree need? Once I, with my, if I follow the four R's, I have an efficiency of at least 70%, and then I can deliver, uh, and then I need, that means I need to deliver the 211 pounds. So what I would like to do next is to illustrate a couple actually four examples where this efficiency goes down. And I like to do that because these are not random examples. These are the most common situations that we have observed that occur in agriculture systems, in orchards, in tree production, and are key because when our efficiency goes down, what do you think happens with that extra nitrogen? It, it can go down, up, it get lost. So having a high efficiency, it's key for and good for everybody. Because what you want to do with the nitrogen, you want to make sure that it goes into the tree. So the amount that you invest into that nitrogen, it's recovered by the tree uptake. And you don't want to, you don't want to leach that nitrogen and have environmental pollution. So these are four examples. So the first example I'm going to show is application errors. The second one is year-to-year -year, year yield variation. And the, the, the third one is in-field variability. And the fourth one is between-field variability. And one thing I would like to say that it's not there specifically, but it's also part of all this, is the water uniformity, irrigation uniformity. All of this, it's it starts with having a good irrigation system a start, or a good management of your irrigation. Remember that in a technified irrigation system, you can get with two efficiencies to deliver that water to the tree up to 90%. Okay? If you are managing that system correctly, if the uniformity coefficients are very high, and so on. So keep in mind that if your irrigation system is not performing adequately, your nitrogen, your ability to deliver nitrogen is not going to be adequate either. OK? So keep in mind that a good irrigation system will, it, it's in place. Here are a couple of more errors. In this table, you can see an I'm going to focus your attention in the first column of the table. And this is the uh, pounds of nitrogen per acre. In, and in the, each row are different orchards. And I would like to focus your attention in the last two orchards. So in, in this orchard, in the second to last orchard, the application rate was 225 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And in the other orchard, 450 pounds. So we have two orchards. In one, we applied 20, 225. And in the other one, we apply 450 pounds of nitrogen to orchards. Now let's focus our attention in the third column where we have the yield. In the, in the second to last orchard, we have 3,830 pounds per acre. And in the last orchard, we had 3,679 uh, pounds per acre of kernel. So again, the orchard that I applied 225 pounds produced 3,830. The orchard that I applied 450 pounds produce it 3,679. What do you think happened with the use efficiency, with efficiency? In this orchard, the nitrogen use efficiency was very good, was higher than 80%. While in this orchard, the nitrogen use efficiency was very low, lower than 45%. Because I apply in excess of what I produce, way in excess. 
So and where do you think that natrium probably went? Downstairs. OK? So uh, the, the point here to illustrate is that any, every orchard is a unique decision. So if the orchards are going to have different yield potential or different yields, actual yields, the amount of natrium that they should receive should be different. And according to that. Here's an example where instead of having two orchards, we're going to have one orchard. And I use pistachios, but it really doesn't, doesn't matter that it's pistachios because they, it's to illustrate the concept and the principle that is the same across all fruit tree production. So this is one single orchard that we track for many years, in 2002, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And we calculate the efficiency of that natural use efficiency. And being close to the dash blue line means that the orchard was very efficient that year. Being clo close to the red dash line means that we were inefficient, that the orchard was inefficient that year. And you can see how one, one two, three, four out of six times, the orchard was very close, had a very high nutrient use efficiency. But all what it takes is to have a couple of bad years, a couple of years where the yield wasn't keeping mind or uh, the, plant, the, the demand didn't, didn't balance with the supply, and we have a lot of inefficiency in the system and nitrogen leaching as well. So what I'm, if in, well in the, same exam, in the first example, I tried to illustrate the point that every orchard is a unique decision. Here I'm trying to illustrate the point that every year is a unique decision that you need to take. So in the next slide. Excuse me. So yep. On the pistachios, you're yep. still using the 68 pounds per thousand pounds of nuts? No. It's, an, it's another ratio. I, it's, it's, but I mean, in this case, it's, a, it's, an, it's, a, it's another number that we calculate. We have numbers for pistachio, for walnuts, for almonds. Um, so we, uh, this is the number for pistachio. But it's the same principle. It's the same, it's the same challenge. In this third example, I would like to illustrate something that we call a spatial variability, OK? In this case, we have an 80 acres plot where we recorded individual tree yield. And we observe that there are areas of, the, areas of this 80 acres plot that are high yielding zones and other zones that are very low yielding zones and other ones that are somewhere in the middle. So this is, let's say that now you have a one, one, one pump, one fertigation to, to fertigate all this 80 acres plot. How do you do it? How do you fertigate that so everybody is happy? I mean, if you do it based in the demand of these trees here that have high production, then you need to apply, uh, this, you will make this section of the orchard happy, but all of these ones will be in excess. If you fertigate so that these trees here are adequate, then these ones are going to be deficient. If you fertigate the average, if you use the average of the orchard, then nobody is happy. So how do you manage this? Um, and I had to recognize that this is a challenge. And in the past, we didn't even recognize this challenge. Now we recognize it. And I hope that in the future, we have viable tools to address it. Um, perhaps in the far, far future, we have the ability to inject fertigation according to the three needs. That sounds really futuristic. But maybe, maybe not so much in the future, we could have a viable way to subdivide this orchard in five acres plot and instead of a one, 180 acres plot and apply natrium according to the demands of the different plots. Maybe not so far in the future, we can do it in 20 acres plot. Maybe even in the present, we can divide the orchard in two and just one bulb and save a lot in fertilizers and so on. So the solutions are going to be very particular to what is going to be the source of variability and so on. But what I'm trying to say is that walk the orchards, check those low, identify those low yielding areas see why they are being 
what, what the reason is behind to have low yield. Many times, I bet you, it's not gonna be because of natrium. But identify, try to solve that problem so you increase uniformity of your orchard. And if you cannot, try to see, if you cannot do it, try to see approaches how you can reduce that variability as in this example. Here's a, the last example I brought, and this is a hypothetical, okay? So let's assume these are almond orchards uh, with different, and these are the yields per pound per acre. And you can see this is a macro picture, so you can see different orchards, different plots, different units. Some of them are very high yielding, let's say 4,953 pounds, near 5,000 pounds. Another ones are low yielding, let's say immature orchards growing. 1,500 pounds and so on. Other ones are in the more 3,000 range or 2,000 range and so on. So you have some orchards that are in their best years, best yielding years ever, and let's focus on those ones there in the corner, and other orchards that are still growing and in low yielding years. If I apply 275 pounds to all of these orchards, what do you think it happens? That's what happens with the nutrient use efficiency. You will have some orchards that are going to be above 100% efficient, and other orchards that are going to be below 35% efficient. Is that good? Of course not. More than 100% efficiency means that these trees were deficient. We didn't provide enough natrium to support that yield. Uh, on, the contra uh, on the other hand, less than 70% efficiency, this number here, 35%, means that uh, we apply natrium in excess and a lot of that went into leaching, most likely. So the point here to illustrate is that not just the decision of two orchards is a specific decision. But if I manage multiple orchards, I have to come up with multiple decisions on how much to apply, based on how much they will yield. Here's a slide that illustrates that in our studies, we got about 80% of uh, nutrient use efficiency. Um, so just to show you, this was in following best management practice with the four R's. Um, so enough about right rate, and efficiency. Let's talk now about right time. And this is the only slide I brought about right time. And it's a very rich slide with a lot of information that I would like to illustrate and discuss with you. So here are the bullets, here are the message, the takeaway message that you have for you in, in your handouts that you can read later on. But let's pay attention a little bit first to this graphic. So in this graphic, you can see in the y-axis the per percentage of soil nutrient uptake in the whole tree. So how much nutrient is the tree taking from the soil? 20%, 40%, 60% across the whole season. Here's the dates, okay? And here's the phenology. So from 70% leaf out to senescence. One thing that is, is striking here is that before leaf out, how much is the uptake from the soil? How much is the uptake before leaf out? Zero. zero, I see some hands there, yep, zero. So what does it tell us? Don't put it on soil. Until leaf out, until middle of March or so on, correct? So that's a first take message, take away message. Don't put it out. What's going to happen with that? It may rain, it will leach. So the tree doesn't need it. The trees, uh, all of this occurs to, with the storage of the tree. So the tree is not actively uptaking nitrogen. And then you have a, a straight, a very a, a, a big slope, the tree really <laughs> taking nitrogen from where? What is happening here? What happens here? The tree takes the nutrient from the soil. About 90% of the, uh, up to harvest, about 90% of the nutrient, the whole nutrient demand uh, comes from the soil. It's uptaken from the soil. 
So that tells us that that's our window of opportunity to make sure that whatever we apply is uptaken by, it's, the tree takes, it, take, takes, takes that up. So based on this graphic, we have come out with uh, best management practices uh, and identified the, the times of the year where you are more, more efficient applying nitrogen. Uh, so, uh, the current recommendation is that between leaf out and whole split, you need to make sure that you apply most of your nutrient, 80, at least 80, the 80% of your total plant. There is very little uptake that occurs at the end of the quarter, okay? And specifically after harvest, there is very little uptake that occurs. There's mainly remobilization from the tree. From those leaves that are green and start to become yellow, they change color because the green color, that is the nitrogen, goes back to the buds, to the, to the trunk, to the perennial structures to support next year flowering, next year's leaf out. So that is not, doesn't take it that much from the soil. And if you keep in mind that after harvest, maybe your irrigation system is not performing at the best, or maybe your trees, you didn't have the opportunity to irrigate your trees on time, and they don't have that much leaf, or they have no leaves, and those leaves, are the ones that are remaining, are yellow, the uptake capacity of that tree in those conditions is going to be very low. And your capacity to provide that nitrogen is going to be also very low because the irrigation system is not going to be adequate. So be careful. Be careful with that fall, late harvest application. It's uh, the, definitely the highest risking the, the, the high risk times are after harvest, these applications here and the applications here are the ones that are actually going to likely contaminate and are not going to be effective for our tree production. While on the other hand, the applications here are the most effective to provide what the tree needs. This is a slide about the right, uh, right place. And here, we did a simulation of in a 12 hours irrigation cycle, we injected the fertilizer in the first three hours, okay? So if you inject, the, if, you're, if, you, if you have a 12 hours irrigation event and you inject the fertilizer during the first three hours of that event, this is what happens in the soil underneath the ground. Most of your nitrogen gets accumulated around 30 inches deep. What do you think about that? Good or not good? Not good. Not good, not good because it gets accumulated beyond the active root zone that almond trees have to uptake that nitrogen. It doesn't mean, so here in our studies, we have observed that most of the active roots that are responsible for the majority of nitrogen uptake are in the first 18 inches of soil. So your, your, your goal is to make sure that that nitrogen gets accumulated in those first 18 inches and not beyond, below that. So how do you do that? Instead of, instead of applying the nitrogen during the first three hours, apply it in the second half of your, fertil of, of your irrigation event. Common sense, or not? So if you move your fertigation timing to the second half of your irrigation event, you are, by definition, you are making sure that the, fer that the fertilizer gets, gets concentrated here instead of there. Simple. Other things to keep in mind. If you are gonna, if you wanna catch up with the humidity of your soil, and you want to do a 24 hours cycle event in the, in the second week of June, okay? Or May, let's say May. You, second week of, of May, you want to do a 24 hours event. And then you're going to irrigate, instead of 24 hours, you're going to irrigate four hours at the following week. When do you do your fertigation? In the first week or in the following week? In the following week, 
in the following week because if you put it at the beginning, in the first, in the first part of the 24-hour cycle, then you're going to put a lot of water, and that's going to leach. Well, if you put it at the end of that cycle or at the following week, you're going to have all that humidity already in the soil, and then you're going to put that nitrogen, and it's going to be converted very fast, and it's going to be uptaken very fast. So your management decisions on when to apply affect the right place. I'm going to skip the right source, um, and I'm going to go to the right monitoring. I would like to really mention that you, need to be, you can be proactive. And now you have a way to sample in April, send the samples to the lab, get your nutrient analysis, and have an idea of, uh, of your tree nutrient status and how they are going to look for su by summer. So that gives you an idea and allows you to be proactive. And yes, as, as, a, as a comment about it. This is the leaf nutrient sampling. And when, before we started this project, we ran a survey to many growers like you. And they, they, the first question we asked growers was like, do you collect leaf nutrient, analysis, leaf nutrient samples in summer? And 90% of the growers say yes. So everybody collect the leaf nutrients and uh, leaf samples, or most of the people collect them in summer. When we run the second question, uh, and we ask the same people, do you use those results to manage or modify your fertilization plan? 90% of the people said no. So everybody collects in summer, but nobody adjusts accordingly. And so we discovered that they actually the the problem with that was that it, for nitrogen, not for necessarily for the other nutrients, but for nitrogen, because you need to apply it before that, it was too late. So it was, it was a reactive, it was too late. There was no time, by the time you get the results back from the lab, there was no time to adjust. So we decided to move that early in the season, and we collected a lot of data, and now you have a robust sampling protocol to send the samples and have an idea if you need to adjust or not in May or June. So I will conclude by saying that what I've been trying to say during the whole presentation, that you need to base your fertilization rate on realistic orchard-specific yield, accounting for all nitrogen inputs and adjust in response to spring nutrient and yield estimates. Make a pre-season fertilizer plan based on expected yield, less than nitrogen irrigation and other inputs. Conduct a leaf analysis in mid-April. And in May, review your estimations. Walk again the orchard. See if what you predicted as yield, it's the same as, uh, as today. And chain accordingly. If you, if you think you're going to get less yield, then there's time to adjust. At harvest, review yields and adjust uh, and do the post-harvest fertilization accordingly to the tree health and the capacity of your irrigation system. It has to be in good conditions. If it's not, it's not even worth to apply it. Here is a guidance of the time application that we were covering. And every field, every year, a unique decision. And there is no better person to take these technical decisions than you guys. So that's the invitation. Take those technical decisions. And a good guidance to do that is the Natrium Calculator. Remember, it's available for free uh, and, uh, and it's part of our California Almond Sustainability Program. So that's what I brought. Okay.